Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Design in Computer Science. In this video we are going to talk about pair testing, so let's go. So in the last video I mentioned how you modify the statistical inference test to, the situ to use it in the situation where we want to compare two samples. In this part, I want to study a special situation that is quite common, where there is a strong dependency between observation across samples. The mathematical change is pretty minor, but the results can be very different. So it's important for you to pay attention to learn how to identify the situation where you have paired comparisons because the result with pair comparison and without pair comparison is very different, okay? So let me give you two examples. The first one is about football shoes. Imagine that you want to compare two brands of football shoes and you want to know which one wears out faster. So what you're going to do is that you're gonna have a team play two games. In one game, the team is wearing shoe A in the other game, team wear, team, the team is wearing shoe B. And you're going to measure the amount of wear in each player's shoes, like how much the shoe become old from the beginning to the end of the game. Now, when you're in a situation like this, you know that the wear in the shoes is not the same for other players. For instance, the forward will run back and forth a lot, but the goalkeeper will stay in the same place for the entire game. So we expect that the shoes of the goalkeeper will wear much less than the shoes of the forward of the mid team. Okay. Now let's think of a different experiment. This one is about fuel efficiency. Let's say that you're developing a new type of fuel and you want to see if the new type of fuel is more efficient than the old type of fuel. So you choose 10 cars and you fill each of these cars with one of the type one few run until the few uh, runs out and measure how long, how far they went. Okay, so far car one, fill the tank, see how far they go, and then try the other few, fill the tank, see how far they go. Now, you know that different cars, they consume fuels at very different rates. If you have a small car, it might be more efficient. If you have a large car, it might be less fuel efficient. So you're gonna have this difference. Not all cars consume fuel at the same rate. What is it? Uh, let's let now give you a uh, computer science example. Let's imagine that we are a uh, computer scientist and we are developing optimization algorithms. So we have two optimization algorithms, optimization algorithm A, and we want to compare the convergence speed and we want to compare with a state of the art. So let's call it method B, okay? So we are going to compare these optimization algorithms on several types of optimization problems. In the field of optimization problems, we have optimization problems with different characteristics. Some optimization problems are monomodal, some optimization problems are multimodal, some optimization problems are deceptive, some of the objective problems, they are like discontinuous. So if we select problems with different characteristics, uh, we can expect that some problems will be harder to solve and some problems that will be easier to solve. So some problems will have high convergence speed and some problems will have low convergence speed. Okay, so what is the common thing about all of these uh, experiments? Well, we have observations that they are dependent on some external factor and the external factor will affect the observations and will affect both methods, which means that each observation can have very different value, very different value of shoe wear, very different value of um, Convergence speed, very different value, level of fuel efficiency. Let's see how this affects the experiments. Now, let's concentrate for now on the uh, computer science example. So, we have a benchmark of problems and we have two optimization methods. We execute both methods on the, benchmark, on the set of benchmarks and we measure the time to convergence for each problem. 
the measurements are made under the same homogeneous conditions. So we guarantee that all other effects are the same, same computer, same operating system, same conditions, so that the only influence on the results is the type of algorithm used and the type of problem. And, and this is important. The, the, uh, the convergence speed of one observation is influenced by the algorithm, but it's also influenced by the problem type. Okay, so in this example, we're taking several problem instances and running each of the two algorithms in all instances. So because of the expected variation in running time, we might want to run one pair algorithm instance multiple times. And this is one thing that people often mistake, uh, that what is exactly one observation? Is one repetition of one algorithm on one problem, one observation? Or for instance, if I run one algorithm on one problem many times, can I take the average of these many times runs and say that that is one observation? Okay, so think a little bit about this difference and see what do you come up with. So, why is pairing necessary? Why do we need to do the procedure of pairing? So when we, co we consider observations with strong dependencies, so players in the football example, cars in the few example, benchmark problems, the difference between observations is a strong noise of variation. Now, one thing that we have to remember is that one of the large, one of the big objectives of experiment design is to control any source of observations that we are not interested in. So for instance, in the player example, we are only interested in the different types of shoes. We're not interested in the different type of players. So we want to design our experiment so that the influence of player types does not affect the conclusion of the experiment. And that's what we're going to study today. One elegant solution to eliminate the influence of noise parameters is pairing the measurements of the problems. So we consider the observation in pairs, pair A, B, for each problem, each benchmark problem in this case. And the hypothesis test is done on the samples of differences of a benchmark. Okay. So let's think about the experimental design. Again, we have Y, A, J, and Y, B, J to be our observations. Observation of method A on problem J and observation of method B on problem J. Okay. What we're going to observe here is the difference between the uh, performance of A and the performance of B. That's what we're interested. Like in the previous video, we want to see the difference between the performance of A and the performance of B. If we transform this in a model, we can say that Y, I, J, the convergence time of method A on problem J is composed of four factors. The first factor is the grand mean, is the general mean of the model. The second factor is the error, the change related to the method I, where we have method A and method B. And then the third factor is the difference in convergence because of the problem type. So we have for problem type 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And finally, we have random noise for all the factors that we did not control, but we expect to be relatively small. So again, mu is the grand mean, tau i is the effect of the method, beta j is the effect of the problem, and epsilon is the residual. Now, our difference that we are interested in is dj, which is y a j minus y b j. So this would be mu t, uh, tau a beta j epsilon a j minus the same for b. And if we group that, we have mu plus b j minus mu minus b j, and we can cross this. So in the end, what we are interested in is the difference of between the effects of the methods, which we're gonna call mu d, the mean of the difference, and the errors. And we have all the errors of a and all the errors of b, so we are subtracting, so we got and the arrows, they have positive and negative. We expect them to be normal. So they are symmet symmetrical around zero. So we can just invert the signal and we have plus epsilon j. Now, since we have focusing on mu d, our hypothesis can be formed around mu d. The new hypothesis is that the difference between methods is zero 
And the alternate hypothesis is that the difference between methods is not zero. So now we are back to our traditional sample test. We have one variable, mu d, that we measure by calculating the difference between the two samples, and we want to compare it against zero. That's the first example, that's the same uh, statistic as in the first class. So we have our t statistic, which is the observed mean of differences divided by the error of the differences divided by the square root of the number of observations in the sample. Now, uh, some points that we should not forget. When we are comparing two algorithms, like in the steel bar example, we need to consider the uh, minimum interesting effect size. However, uh, because we have different problems that can have very different results, we, it's not very good to define the minimum effect size in term, absolute terms, because the difference can be big or small depending on the difficulty of the problem. In this case, it's better to define the minimum interest, uh, interesting effect size in terms of average gain across problems. Okay. The most important sample size to consider in this situation is the number of problems, not the number of repetitions. Repetitions for the same problem is just to reduce the variance inside the problem doing two uncontrolled factors. But our one observation here is running the algorithm many times in one problem. It's the mean of running the algorithm in that problem. That's one observation for this, for, for this case. The number of repetitions in each problem will have an impact, of course, but that's an impact in the, in the uncertainty associated with the observation. So just to summarize, the paired experimental design removes the effect of controllable nuisance factors, problem type, personal characteristics, etc. And it's strongly correlated in cases where there is a strong correlation of samples in different treatments. So let's see how this works in practice. So let's go back to our observation, uh, our algorithm optimization algorithm example. Let's assume the following. Let's say that we have a benchmark with seven problems. Okay, this is the number of problems that we have. And we are interested in finding uh, differences in mean time to convergence that are greater than 10 seconds with a power of at least 0 0.8, beta 0 0.2, right? With a significance level of alpha equals 0, 0, 0.05. Now, we perform 30 repeated runs, and these repeated runs of our each problem is just to reduce the error of each problem. The number of observations here is the number of problems. And we obtain this data. So for problem one, algorithm A converging 37 seconds. For problem one, algorithm B converging 53 seconds. For problem seven, algorithm A converging 300 seconds. For problem seven, algorithm B prefer, per, uh, converges also around 300 seconds. So you, you see that depending on the problem, there is a very big difference. Okay, uh, here is how we obtain this aggregation of data from all the uh, from all the observe from all the repetitions. Now, if we plot this, we can see. Uh, for problem one, the, the time, for problem two, the time, for problem three, the time, and we see that the time increases with the problem. And very important, the difference of time because of the problems is bigger than the difference of time because of the methods. Okay, And this will result in different results for the statistic if we use pairing or if we do not use pairing. So first, let's use pairing. To use pairing in R, it's just like setting the paired variable to be true, okay? So there is not a lot of uh, complication that you need to do. It's the, the same technical uh, procedure. The technical procedure is not important. It's important that you understand when to use pairing and when not to use pairing. Now, if we do the test paired, we can see our p-value is 0 0.95, so this shows that the difference is significant. And we see that the mean of the differences is minus 17. So this is even bigger than our minimal uh, difference of importance. So this is an important difference, and it's an important difference with a significance uh, which is statistically significant. 
Remember, here we have the confidence interval of the difference, so the difference is somewhere between minus 21 and minus uh, 12. Now, what happens if we don't do it paired? Oh, sorry. Now, here is another way to calculate. So, note that to calculate the paired test, what we do is that we have the time for method A, and we have the time for method B, and we subtract the time for method A from the time of method B, and this will give us an array of differences. And we can do the t-test on top of the array of differences, and we get exactly the same result. Okay? Why do Here we have only one sample, here we have a pair t-test. I want you to test these two differences. Try to understand why is it the same result when you just subtract these two vectors and when you are actually doing the paired analysis. It's good if you take a look at the model and see uh, the calculation and see how the two calculations are equivalent. Of course, after you do the test, you still need to um, evaluate the assumptions of the test. So the pair test, uh, the pair t-test has an assumption of normality of the residuals. So we should check the normality of the residuals. Uh, and here we observe that we have one big outlier, right? So each you, one outlier like this will not invalidate the results of the test, but you should observe, see why this outlier. Is this because of an error in the experiment or why do you have an outlier here? It's important to understand like each of these observations, when we do these sort of tests, one error that students always start to do is just to treat all of the, the experiments as numbers. But each of these experiments is a unique flower, okay? So if you see this very strange tree in the middle of your experimental flowers, you want to see what is wrong with this. Like, why is this a outlier, okay? Uh, this might indicate some error or this might indicate something that you don't understand about the experiment or it might just be nothing. It might just be that this problem is really, really difficult and you still learn something new. So what happens if we don't do pairing? So here's the same t-test on the data, but we don't do pairing this time. And when we look here, we see that this test does not reject the new hypothesis. Our confidence interval is the difference is between minus 100 and 86. This is a huge confidence interval. We have no idea if they are the same or not. They probably are the same. So we got the absolute opposite answer by not using a paired test here. Why did we get this? If we look again at our data, we see that for the algorithm A and for the algorithm B, they are very similar. If we ignore testing, these are A, and these are B. So when we look at these two, when we look at these two samples and we don't know that there is an external factor that will affect the samples, this looks like two identical samples. Okay? They look like identical samples. But when we know that they are paired, when we know that there is a factor that relates this sample with this sample and this sample with this sample and this sample with this sample, with this sample when we know they are paired, we can use uh, we can see we can use this difference to see that in fact they are different. There is a difference that is applied by the algorithm. So that was it for the class today. I hope you enjoyed and please uh, think about uh, the the differences between paired and unpaired testing and pay a lot of attention in your experiment to see which one you have to use. Uh, if you use a paired test when your design is unpaired, or if you use an unpaired test when your design is paired, you're going to get a totally wrong result. It's a small changing sign that changes completely the result of your statistical analysis. Okay, so be careful and have fun.